Hi everyone and welcome to our lesson on composting 101 at the Campus Urban Farm. So why compost at the Campus Urban Farm? Uh, first of all, the farm is committed to functioning as a sustainable system. So we really want to exemplify the best practices that we can when it comes to sustainability and composting is a key part of that. Um, composting is important because it allows us to reuse products, energy, and resources and put them back into the system in a natural way. Um, so it essentially replicates the natural process of decomposition, which helps get nutrients back into the soil. Um, plus, we can obviously use that valuable compost on our crops um, and help them grow better. Uh, so win-win for everyone. Um, so when it comes to composting, uh, there are a lot of benefits. Um, so even if you don't compost um, or even outside of the farm, um, composting still has benefits to any garden um, as well as the planet. Um, so first of all, it's a natural way to restore, restore really vital nutrients to your soil uh, to ensure uh, plant production. Um, and it also helps to aid in water retention for your plants. Um, and from a sustainability perspective, uh, making sure that we can reduce uh, the amount of food waste that ends up in landfills and actually apply it to useful functions like composting um, is really good for the environment. Um, food waste in general is a major source of methane, so um, which is a greenhouse gas that's 23 times more potent than CO2. Um, so in terms of fighting climate change, uh, making sure that food waste actually decomposes into compost as opposed to just creating more greenhouse gases in landfill um, is obviously a better use of those food scraps. Um, and also, uh, I wanted to emphasize that composting is a natural process. Um, essentially, if you leave any organic material out in the environment, um, it's able to break back down into soil um, and enhance those nutrients. Um, so this essentially brings back a natural cycle um, to the gardening process. Um, so in terms of the basics of composting, you need a few things. Um, so to start off, um, in order to compost, you need oxygen. Uh, composting uh, technically can be done either anaerobic without oxygen or aerobic with oxygen, um, but the we using oxygen is just a much faster way of decomposition um, and easier to do as well. Um, so if we're going with an aerobic uh, composting project, uh, we want to make sure that these microorganisms continue in the soil continue or the composting continues to thrive. Um, so compost must periodically be stirred or aerated or turned in order to oxygenate it. So that's where we get the air from. Um, secondly, you'll also need moisture. Uh, generally, in composting, that moisture naturally comes from the organic materials that you're putting in, especially the greens that have a lot of, uh, you know, water built in. Uh, but additional moisture can be a, a added if it's a, a super dry uh, composition uh, just by applying water directly. Uh, but you do need moisture in order to ensure a, a good composting project. Um, thirdly, you want to support living microorganisms in that compost to really help break that material down. Um, so organic materials already contain living microorganisms, uh, but making sure that they stay alive with good moisture, with good oxygen, um, and that'll aid the process of decomposition. Um, however, if you do find that it's not very active, uh, you can always add additional microorganisms uh, through the form of an, a specialty inoculant. Um, so there are ways to make sure that we maintain this balance of the three elements uh, to make sure that we can continue composting, um, comp composting projects successfully. So in terms of the final ingredient that you need is time. So uh, for any composting project, you're not gonna be able to generate compost right away. Um, and uh, you know you just need to let that sit for a while to make sure that you're hitting um, several things, including uh, the ideal pH levels for compost is generally between six and eight, so it's pretty neutral. Um, so any compost that's too acidic, um, so too fresh, can basically harm the microorganisms involved in breaking down the organic materials. Um, and it's not gonna be very good for your plants either. Um, and generally completed compost uh, still needs to be cured for about three weeks at minimum. Um, as it settles, the temperature and the acidity will decrease. Uh, but if you get too hasty, you don't wait that additional period, um, that compost may still be too acidic, which is more harmful than helpful to your garden. So you really need to be patient when it comes to uh, composting um, for your projects. Um, also in terms of the source material. So in order to actually get composting going, you need to have two sources of things. Um, so one is carbon sources and one is nitrogen sources. 
Um, at the farm, we generally do a ratio of 25 to 1 or 30 to 1 uh, for more carbon versus nitrogen uh, for our farm coast compost projects. Um, though some ratios can go as high as 3 to 1, where it's 3 parts carbon to 1 part nitrogen. Um, but our problem is that generally the higher you go towards the nitrogen, the smellier it gets, and that tends to attract pests, which we do have a problem with at the farm. So for our purposes, we tend to skew very conservatively uh, more towards carbon. Um, so in terms of what's what constitutes a carbon versus a nitrogen source. Um, so carbon is sometimes referred to as browns because that's generally the color of the source that's coming in. Um, so carbon is usually like dried leaves, branches, uh, you know, paper products, so like shredded cardboard, straw, card, corn stalks, like very husky um, kind of vegetable matter, um, you know, newspaper scraps, um, because they're richer in carbon. Um, and the sources that we get that from generally is any of the yard waste from the farm. So if we, you know, prune off some dry leaves or trimmings and things like that, that's a good carbon source. Um, as well as we have as much cardboard and newspaper and shredder paper as you want because we have the whole campus to pull from. Um, so anytime we're running short, we can just ask Recycling to come give us, uh, you know, tons of cardboard and newspaper and shredder paper uh, to help supplement that source. Um, so that makes up the majority of the carbons at the farm. Um, when it comes to nitrogens and greens, um, this is food scraps. So this is the fruit and vegetable scraps, it's coffee grounds, it's those wet tea bags, it's weeds, it's the lawn trimmings, um, just really high greenish looking, um, you know, source material um, that's very fresh and has a lot of moisture um, and uh, is good source for decomposition. Um, so in terms of our sources of nitrogen, um, generally that's the green waste that comes from the farm, so the fresh stuff that we prune off um, or the fresh weeds, um, as well as uh, the food scraps uh, that we collect from the compost drop-off bin in front of the farm. So people who actually donate their food scraps to the compost drop-off bin and we're able to process that and treat that as a source of nitrogen. Uh, so in terms of that source, um, so uh, that bin uh, is located at the front gates of the farm. So that black bin has a sign on it, um, literally 24-7 outdoor compost drop-off bin. So anytime anyone wants to pull up, drop some scraps in there, uh, we collect it periodically. Um, and this was initiated by the first campus urban farm intern for a research project initially and just really took off. Um, so it was actually the first original composting service for the campus. Uh, since then, we've actually added a commercial food scraps composting service um, in, a, in a dumpster that caught gets hauled away by Republic Services over by the LC loading dock. Um, but this is the first true uh, composting service that we offered for the campus uh, when it first started. Um, generally, it's a pretty popular uh, drop-off location. A lot of, you know, gets readily used and filled pretty much every week. Um, some people find that access to be easier than the rest of the campus. And in general, people just like, uh, you know, making sure their food scraps go to the farm as opposed to just being hauled away. So we do tend to attract a lot of food scraps, which is mostly a good thing. Um, However, uh, we're very restrictive compared to the commercial service on what can be dropped off in that bin. Um, generally, anything that's meat-based, so meat, bones, animal proteins, uh, really tend to attract pests, which are a major problem at the farm, um, and also creates really rotten smells when composting. So um, as much as we can, we tell users, hey, please don't bring this to the farm, um, because that causes a lot of problems for us. Um, again, we have that commercial food scraps bin, however, so if any mater unaccepted materials do show up, uh, you can always put that in a separate clear bag. Um, and dump it in the commercial food scraps bin at the LSU loading dock um, or put it in the specialty bin that we have at the farm and we'll haul that for you. Um, and ultimately those scraps end up in a biogas and like an industrial compost facility so they're able to take more materials and aren't as affected by uh, the same conditions. Um, so in terms of the uh, you know acceptable materials, what can be composted again, again really no cooked foods, oils, or meats at the farm. Um, so at the farm specifically, we kind of joke that our worms are on a strictly vegan diet. It's not really going to the worms, but it's kind of makes easy people remember, um, you know, what they can actually put in. So anything that's vegan is essentially a good uh, food source material for uh, being able to do composting in a small scale um, projects like the ones that we have at the farm. Um, and similarly to home composting setups, the thing, the projects that we have on the farm, um, there are some serious limitations to what materials can be composted. Um, so most food waste can be safely composted at home. Um, however, anytime you're dealing with uh, meat and dairy items, uh, that really tends to uh, create a lot of smells. It, it attracts a lot of pests. It really slows down the decomposition 
composition process. Um, so you really should avoid that when you're using a non-commercial composting setup like we have at the farm or maybe that you have at home. Um, with the exception of eggshells, because they do provide a lot of calcium and nutrients. Um, however, so you can use that in your own home uh, composting systems. Um, we can process eggshells, but we tend to avoid them just because it tends to be really messy and attract those same pests that we don't like. Um, just because it has a lot of goo and things like that, which attract the, uh, the pests. So uh, we tend to tell people not to bring that if they can. Um, and regardless of, uh, of that situation, um, animal, animal waste should never be composted in a home setup or at the farm, um, just because that has the potential to introduce uh, harmful bacteria, even if it is gonna break down. So definitely uh, not okay in terms of acceptable materials um, for composting. Um, in terms of the composting projects that we have, we have open air composting um, projects. Um, so in the picture, you can kind of see to the right that there are these pallets that are set up in very loose open piles of organic material. Um, so these are open air composting piles. Um, so they were created around two years ago um, and only recently have really started to decompose into usable nutrient rich soil. Um, and that's kept at a 30 to one carbon uh, to nitrogen rate ratio for the decomposition process to start. Um, so this features a lot of cardboard paper, et cetera, in terms of the carbon sources. Um, so to get that aeration back into these piles, um, basically you can turn regularly with a shovel um, by essentially moving the layers around back and forth between the piles to help really speed up that process. Um, so essentially uh, it's just basically taking all of the material, you start from the top and go to the, go to the next uh, space over. Um, and it essentially puts all the stuff at the top of the pile, at the bottom of the pile, and then you just rinse and repeat as often as you have time or interest, essentially. Um, and the faster you do it, the faster you'll get your compost out of it. So that's how that particular project works. Uh, the other uh, system, composting system that we have next to it are the rotating compost bins. Um, so these are, uh, you know, just, you know, from the store composting bins that actually rotate. So instead of you having to shovel anything, um, they're a little bit easier to maintain. Uh, they save some space. They're more effective and faster than the piles because it's easier to get that oxygenation in. Um, so essentially when you put the material in there, you can just spin the bin um, and it'll just roll around for you. And then that's basically how we get compost out of those particular systems. So a um, little bit uh, easier on the back compared to the open air uh, piles, but another example of composting. Um, so there's another example of composting at the farm, which isn't really technically composting in the traditional sense. Um, so we do have a worm farm inside the nursery shed. Um, and the reason we locate it inside the nursery shed is because it needs to be kept cool because we have living worms in there uh, that would not be very happy with heat. Um, and vermicompost is generally a different kind of composting style. Um, so instead of adding a bunch of materials and hoping that they mix together, you would add worms to essentially help break down the food scraps and accelerate that process. Um, so essentially, if you were to bring just regular food scraps, um, again, staying away from meat and dairy products, but you know, the food scraps that you uh, collect, um, you put that into the top layer of the bin so the worms can get at it, cover it up. Um, and the worms can actually go through about three to four kilograms of kitchen waste um, every week. They eat basically double their, uh, their body size, so they're able to get through that pretty quickly. Um, and an added side benefit is that when they go through that process, um, it creates moisture um, or leachate which tends to percolate to the bottom of the bin. Um, and you can actually see that little hose tap at the bottom of our worm farm, uh, which if you uh, actually open the tap and uh, collect that liquid, um, if you dilute it with about 10 gallons of water, you can actually spray it directly on your plants um, and actually get a, a free uh, fertilizer essentially um, that, uh, that just comes out of that worm farm system. So lots of win-wins with this particular type of composting style. And we have a dedicated video on that as well. Um, so in terms of non-farm disposal options, so let's say that you have materials that you can't compost. Um, so they're unacceptable or they're just not, they're not organic material. Uh, where does it go? Um, so gen in general, we have about four bins at the front of the farm gate. So keep an eye out for those. Um, we have one bin that's called landfill, AKA trash. So this is all the non-recyclable materials, the packaging, the soil bags, the plastic film, um, stuff that you essentially can't recycle or you can't compost. Um, the blue bin next to it is the recycling, um, uh, AKA mixed recycling bin. Um, so anything that's like hard plastics, cans and bottles, uh, you know, usable cardboard, paper, uh, metal, things like that, um, that can go into the mixed recycling bin. 
Um, and then we also have the commercial compost, which is where you put um, organic materials that won't go, that you can't be processed by the farm compost systems, but it's still organic material, so it can still be composted in a commercial system. Um, so that system can actually accept meat and bones and breads and cooks food and oils and things like that. Um, and there's already, and uh, you know, basically be able to get processed at the biogas facility. Um, however, it's important that we still can't accept any packaging or compostable ware. Um, the facility actually can't handle it since it's uh, straight up just using the food scraps to compost. Um, and also it must be in a clear bag so they can see the contents. If it's not in a clear bag, we'll actually just treat it as trash and it'll just uh, get thrown out as soon as it reaches the facility. Um, when, it, when it's in a clear plastic bag, they can clearly see that it's organic material. Um, they'll pop the bag, at, the bag at the composting facility um, and take it out for you. Um, so that's essentially what that bin is uh, designed to, to collect. Um, and in terms of the fourth bin, um, we also have a yard waste. So even though this is organic material, um, this is more aligned with garden waste or uh, you know grounds waste. Um, so things that wouldn't go very well into the pile. So let's say there's diseased leaves that you don't necessarily want contaminating, um, or eucalyptus leaves that are actually kind of a pesticide uh, when it comes to uh, suppressing the growth of other plants. So they'll still break down, um, or if it's just too much, right? So if these, the green waste is just too overwhelming, there's way too many branches and leaves and things like that, um, and we can't process it in our own small scale system, um, then you can put it into the yard waste bin um, and that'll actually get taken away for commercial hauling elsewhere. Um, so those are your options if uh, the regular composting uh, doesn't work for you in terms of the materials that you're encountering. Um, so hopefully that was helpful in terms of explaining how we compost at the farm. Uh, again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at dhurbanfarm at gmail.com. Thank you for your attention.